Welcome to our Extended Words segment, Words Matter More. Broadcaster at Wordsmith Extraordinaire, Kel Richard, joins me now. Welcome, Kel. We've got some great words tonight. Uh, a lot of words I think that people will know or think they know and you'll tell them a little bit more than they thought they knew. Battler, Eric from Newcastle has written to us. He says, my father grew up during the Depression. When I was young, he sometimes used the term battler to, to, to describe any poor worker who fought hard to provide for his family. He didn't use it dismissively, he says. It was a word of strength and dignity. Today it's been replaced by the contemptuous word loser, he says, which is a blight on our American borrowings. Now, I happen to agree. Um, my dad used battler quite a lot. I think there's a lot of dignity in the word battler. What do you think, Kel? Oh, absolutely. You're right. Your dad is right. Uh, the, the word battler started off as a very negative word. Uh, in the late 1800s, it was used as a word for a prostitute. I mean, basically, it means someone who's got a battle in life, and that was the way people looked on prostitutes. But by the 1930s, by the time of the Great Depression, it was being used of anyone who was on Struggle Street, anyone who was having a really hard time of it. And it was a positive complimentary expression. This is someone not giving up. This is someone fighting the battle of life. And that's why you had Howard's battlers in the John Howard years. Uh, it's a very complimentary expression. It is not the equivalent of the American loser. And anyone who thinks it is does not understand our language. And you make a very good point there. A, a loser has accepted they've lost the fight. Yep. But a battler is still in the fight. Right? That's a battler right. hopes they will prevail. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, Baz and Heather from Albury, they want to know about the pronunciation, the correct pronunciation of harass. I say harass, but I know a lot of people say Harris. Who, who's right? Well, the Oxford says unhelpfully both are acceptable, but it prefers <laughs> Harris. Right now, I don't prefer Harris. Like you, I say harass. Uh, but so quite frankly, uh, I'm not going to go around complaining about people who say harass, but I'm going to go on saying harass. That's what I've said all my life, and I think you and I are on the same page on that one. So, so does that mean it's harassment, not harassment? No, no again, both pronunciations are acceptable. I looked at the Oxford, and, and the, the form of the Oxford I've got, where I can log in electronically to their big database, actually has a spoken word component. I can click on a little icon, and right. they will say the word to me. And they've got both pronunciations, but they tell you which one they prefer by the order they put them in. So they put harassment before harassment. So they say, we'll accept both, but we think think harassment is a bit better. Well, I'm, I'm happy for them. But, you know, we're not in broad, we're not in the broad in Oxford. We'll say harassment. So what's your adjudication? What's your adjudication? Oh, which, which do you prefer? The one I hear the most, the one I think most Australians say is harassment. I think it's more comfortable. In, in, in a lot of English words, not all mm. of them, but a lot of English words, it's just comfortable to stress the second syllable. So I think that's what we, we instinctively do. All right. Antipodean, I used it on the show the other night and someone asked, what on earth does Antipodean mean? Uh, so give us a bit of its origin and uh, let's hope I had the pronunciation right. You had the pronunciation exactly right. Uh, it means someone who's living on exactly the opposite part of the globe to you. Uh, it came into English late 1300s, early 1400s, and behind it ultimately is a Greek word. And th if you break the word down, uh, the second part of the word, uh, Antipodes, means feet. Uh, and we get the word pedal from the same source, and the ant part means uh, opposite. So it's, it's picturing someone uh, who is standing, uh, whose feet are where our feet are. It's against our feet, so it's, it's Antipodean. So that our feet are facing the feet of the people in Britain, I suppose, is the way it was originally imagined and the way it was originally used. But for us, they are the Antipodeans. Ah, OK, I don't know that part's picked up a lot because uh, often you see it referenced in, um, in the 1800s, 1700s, referencing obviously the Great Southern Land, Australia as we know it. Um, but I don't know that you often hear many Australians use the term antipode and pu pushing back to the UK. It's because we're too polite. I mean, they are being a little bit, a little bit impolite about us saying, you know, mere Antipodeans, you know, uh, these rugged colonials, what can you expect from them? Uh, we're far too polite to do that. All right, let's go to the word grog. Paul, one of our viewers, says recent discussions covering Aboriginal dysfunction in remote communities frequently refers to grog. He's keen on the origins of the word grog. And as a side note, the ABC, where you've spent many years, well, 
they don't want reporters to use the word grog anymore. What can you tell us? Well, I don't know why they don't, because it's a perfectly normal, acceptable Australian word. In Australia, in, nine, in 1946, and as far as I know, only in Australia, the word grog was applied to any alcoholic beverage. Before then, grog was really specific. It was a Navy drink drunk by sailors. It was half rum, half water. It came in in 1770. And the bloke who brought it in was a, a, a rear admiral in the uh, British Navy. Uh, his name was, I need to look it up, uh, his name was Rear Admiral, I'll tell you in a moment, Edward Vernon. That's who it was. And he, what he did was he understood that the water in the, in the tubs, in the, the, the butts on the ship, was off and off. It was often bad, unreliable. But if you mixed it 50-50 with mm -hmm. rum, his idea was the alcohol would kill off the bugs in the water. So he brought in this order in 1770 saying that's what you need to do. Now, Edward Vernon always wore a, a coat made of a, a coarse le uh, um, fabric called grogram. So his nickname was Old Grogram. So his rule, his name was abbreviated and applied to the stuff that his rule brought in. And it was called grog. From grogram, from the coat that the Admiral wore. So it's a convoluted story, but that's where it comes from. And I always thought it was some sort of anagram, but clearly, yeah, see, I say this every week, but I learn something every single time we talk. Um, where can people go? Tell them where they can go to get more information from you and send words and phrases and pronunciations our way. Uh, so it's ozwords.com.au. The .au is important. ozwords.com.au. Uh, you'll get the word of the day. You can subscribe for free to the newsletter so the word of the day pops into your inbox every day. And you can send me any question, any comment. If you want to say, Kel, I disagree, I think it's such and such, or you want to ask any question about any expression, that's the way. ozwords.com.au. All right, you can say words to me too on my Instagram, uh, Peter Credlin AO, but you'll see Kel and I, so, uh, six o'clock, Credlin, Wednesday nights, Sky News, but this podcast, skynews.com.au. Thank you for your company. See you next week.